All right, well, um, so welcome everybody. I'm going to call the meeting to order. Um, so the first thing on the agenda is meeting logistics, um, and I'll go more over that when, um, as we go along. Um, so the first thing is to review, and or the next thing is to review and approve the agenda. Uh, so just looking at the, oh yes, um, I am not on the Zoom yet, but I will do that. Um, do we, is the Zoom available? Oh, yeah, sorry. <clears throat> on the it is okay. Okay. Yes, so we will. have her introduce herself soon. Um, uh, Righto, actually, let's do that. Um, uh, Councillor Brown, Carrie Brown, right, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Hi, this is Carrie Brown. I'm attending hey, remotely tonight. Excellent. All right. And uh, all right, so uh, uh, yeah, reviewing and approving the agenda. So looking at the agenda for today, I don't know of <clears throat> excuse me, any changes? Does anybody else have information to that end? And Carrie, just speak up because we can't see you yet. <clears throat> so anybody have information to uh, about changing the agenda? Okay. All right. So with that, we'll consider the agenda approved. All right. So we're going to move on to general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to make a comment on any item that is otherwise not on our agenda. And if you would say your name and where you live, um, that would be great. Um, try to uh, keep your comments under two minutes and Donna's going to help us with that. Uh, she'll hold up a sign at one minute and then a stop sign at two minutes. Um, and we might um, interrupt you if you um, if you uh, get to that point. Uh, if you yeah, there you go. Uh, if you wish to speak, you need to be um, called on by me. Um, and if you have multiple questions or comments, we would ask that you make them all together, sort of sequentially, and then um, we can address them uh, after you've. Uh, made your comment or asked your questions um, all together um, so that we could because we don't really do a, a like a back and forth sort of setting in uh, here. Uh, and also try to keep your comments germane to the discussion uh, general business and appearances is for anything that is not on the agenda and uh, we typically take up public comment on uh, regular agenda items as we go. All right, so I think that is all I want to say for now. Uh, so if you have something you'd like to say, now is the time. Zach Hughes, go ahead. Thank you for recognizing me, uh, Mayor Watson. Um, Zach Hughes from uh, Prospect in Montpelier, Prospect Street. And uh, I just want to, uh, first of all, thank uh, Chief Pete and the Police Department for their um, gracious uh, response uh, in the uh, Garden Park removal area. Uh, when we all got together for uh to, to commemorate that and uh you know and i also want to state that uh i um we had our homelessness task force meeting today and i felt like it was a very productive uh, meeting is that uh, we were able to talk about uh things and feels like getting things kind of done i know we're not going to solve this overnight and i'm not interested in actually solving it just looking at solutions uh and um so i just wanted to say that and um also um hopefully you can shorten the meeting for bill tonight as he needs to get up early in the morning thank you okay thank you um anyone else in person wish to make a comment Uh, with regard to Skirton Park, shame on you, each and every one of you, to yank that out from under the most Did vulnerable. You Stephen Whitaker, Montpelier. Thank you. To yank that resting place out from under the most vulnerable people in Montpelier is a, a gross disregard, callous indifference, bordering on criminal. Uh, the packets, you need to have some printed packets here to respond to agenda items. They, there was a habit of having several packets. It's fallen in the wayside. I'm reminding you to start it back up again. 
online records are insufficient. We need to address ownership of the ORCA recordings like that minutes. we facilitate. Uh, I object to the two minute time limit. That when a person has a number of important topics to raise, you it's a violation of open meeting law to constrain it to two minutes. Uh, we still have inches of dirt in the street. This is the third minute meeting that I brought that up. You can't um, wait for a quarter million and dollars. Then, then the the and so he just told me everybody's that. face. So you don't like feel a, it in so the comfort, like the comfort, comfort of your own right? homes, but it's contaminating people's food in their just, outdoor restaurants. Oh, it's just look at state. Then I find it all later. Look at the sheet in front of the DD bank. Inches of mud that's not going to be picked up by a street sweeper. It needs a shovel and a wheelbarrow or a truck. Uh, we have broken planter boxes. We had several that collapsed into the river, and yet we ha pretend that we're all green and clean. So we don't maintain the infrastructure we have. There's planter boxes on the Langdon Street Bridge that are collapsing uh, on the north, on the south side. Uh, the LED lighting has been vandalized and is inoperable on one of the on one of the spans. I know that you're paying attention, right? Um, but yet we we tell, we require the new business in town that puts some art on the side of their building to take it down because it's not in keeping with our architecture. So the, the hypocrisy of the double standard uh, is, not, uh, is not living up to our best. Um, the trash is overflowing on the bike path. Uh, both barrels will fall. fall and no one is att attending to it. Uh, we need cooling spaces. The, the unsheltered folks now have no sun shelter, and on days it's already 80 degrees, and they need cooling space. I dropped into the transit center before 5 o'clock today, unattended, no staff, bathrooms were locked. In Steve, violation, you're over your two minutes. If you I could am, wrap I'm, your I'm, comments up, thank you. So we're still not enforcing the lease with the transit center tenant to keep those bathrooms open until 6 o'clock. And it's just unconscionable. Your, your gross disregard for the, our own tenant landlord tenant arrangements is unconscionable. While we have emergency and people shitting on the riverbank, so all right. Thank you very much. All right. Anyone hey, else in person? No. Oh, hey, small I'm, thank you. I wasn't done. You've over your two minutes. Thank you very much. Two minutes right, and you're done. Please uh, do not speak out of turn. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Oh, thank you. Anyone else in person wish to say anything? Okay, uh, all right, Linda Berger, go ahead. Here's the unmute, I was trying to find the unmute. Hi, my name is Linda Berger. I live in District 2 in Montpelier. I'm requesting that the city's progress update and supporting information for the city of Montpelier water recovery facilities notice of alleged violation of air pollution control regulations um, be put on the city council agenda for an upcoming meeting. Is that it? <laughs> Less than two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> um, thank you. Yeah, we can do that. All right. Great, thanks. All right. Uh, anyone else with us virtually wish to make a comment? Okay. All right, well then we are going to move on to the consent agenda. Um, is there a motion? Okay, motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, and opposed. Okay, so the consent agenda passes. I just pipe up real quick on that. I only just noticed that the minutes weren't on there. So obviously you all had a link to the minutes. We'll just have those on next time, including the minutes of that. <clears throat> Apologize, I should have looked closer at the agenda. Um, um, Cameron, is there any way we can get the sound louder? So we're having audio issues, and so it's being fed through that microphone right now. Got you. Um, there are a couple folks who are not muting their microphones and as it, it pops up with them while folks are talking. Um, so if, if folks listening could remember to do that, that would be helpful. 
Um, John, would you mind saying that one more time, what you said previously? <laughs> I said there are two or three people who don't have their microphones oh, muted. Okay. That was, and, that was it? Okay. And that's definitely going on. So. No, I, I th I'm at the part about the minutes? Yes, I meant the part about the minutes. Oh, the minutes. Oh, yeah, yeah I, just, I just was aware that the minutes weren't on the agenda. I apologize for that. Um, I'll try to look for that next time. But obviously, you all got a link. They are done. But we'll formally put the on the next agenda along with the minutes for this one. OK, great. Thank you. Okay, uh, so we are up to uh, an appointment to the Wrightsville uh, Dam board member. Uh, and so for that, actually, I, I don't know that there's any. So we have one representative. Um, it has currently unfilled, a uh, gentleman, Dan Courier, who is present, okay. uh, has volunteered. Dan was a former member and then it had to step off because there was a conflict of interest with his then employer, the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission, who I believe he is no longer employed by, so he no longer has a conflict of interest and has okay. reached out to us and would love to get back on. And I probably just stole your speech, Dan. <laughs> Yeah, if you'd come introduce yourself to us. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, so yeah, so Dan Courier, uh, District 3 over on George Street. And so um, as Bill kind of highlighted, I was a member of the Wrightsville Board, um, previous planner with the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission as well. Just a little bit too um, uh, conflicty. Um, the appearance of a conflict of interest is as bad as a conflict of interest, as they say. And so um, I stepped down uh, from the Montpelier board probably about six years ago, seven years ago, um, and then sort of supported Wrightsville as the staff person from CVRPC, so stayed involved um, through that position. And so um, I learned of a vacancy um, because I've stayed in touch with the board um, and their manager, Colin O'Neill, and uh, just uh, knew that they were seeking uh, the second Montpelier rep uh, to be replaced because there's two. One is uh, John Copans, um, and then the second one is vacant. So. Any questions for Dan? Okay. Uh, is there a motion? I can make a motion to nominate Dan for this position. And we mean a point, yes? A point, yes. <laughs> just, yes. just want to make sure it's clear. Okay. <laughs> okay, so there's a motion and a second. Um, any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? Oh, thank you. And opposed? Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. thank you for your service. All right. So we are up to uh, the meeting standards policy. Um, so this is a, an internal policy to uh, the city and how we operate. So, um, but also affects the public and how we how we work with the public. Um, Bill, is there anything else you want to say about this? We did have this reviewed by our lawyer. Correct. Um, so we had an issue that came up. Uh, we've had issues with interruptions during meetings, and council sought to create some more rules. So we did, took a look at, at those in place in other communities, drafted it up, had it run by our attorney who made some suggestions. Those are all incorporated um, and brought them to the council for your discussion. Great. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I've taken a look at this. Um, we'll have comments from council and then uh, comments from the public, and then we'll go back to um, a discussion uh, amongst the council. Uh, but first, thoughts from the council on this. Donna. I, I was very impressed in the detail and it seemed to cover uh, lots of needed material and things we haven't thought of that will prevent unknown conflict, hopefully. There was a section which I can't find about subcommittees. I had a question about the wording. Subcommittees. The, the only section I'm aware of is that in the very first paragraph, it talked about how yeah. this re, re, this counts for all board committees, task forces, it doesn't actually say subcommittees, um, but the intent is that uh, even though it uses the words council and mayor, it's meant to infer any committee in its chair. Okay. I'll review it and let you know. I think it's just missing a word. That's all. But otherwise, I really, really appreciate the work done on it. Yeah. 
Any other comments on this? Okay. All right, uh, comments from the public. Anyone in person? I have, I have a few comments. Can you all hear me? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't okay. see there, Carrie. Go ahead, Carrie. Yeah, that's okay. I, I was trying to use headphones and thinking you might hear better, but it didn't work. Um, so I have, I have just a few comments on this. First of all, I think it looks fantastic. Thank you. It's very, very thorough, very detailed. I really appreciate it. I think it will make things a lot clearer. Um, but I have a couple things that are just sort of, you know, sort of minor nitpicky. And then I have one bigger question about it. Um, so the first one is under section, <clears throat> under the general rule section B, number five, it's titled unwelcome physical conduct, but then it references unwelcome physical contact. So I'm just thinking that that might just be a little bit of a typo and maybe it needs to be consistently physical contact rather than physical conduct. Um, I'll, I, I, can, I can let staff sort that out. It was just jumped out at me. Um, the next thing is just two items later in number seven where it talks about appropriate attire. And again, slightly nitpicky thing, but we don't wanna actually require people to wear pants, right? Like somebody could wear a dress or a skirt. Um, we want people to be clothed on their top and their bottom however they do that, right? So I don't think we should specify the exact articles of clothing. Um, so if we could just change that to be more inclusive, I think that would be helpful. And then the third and final thing that I had is um, if we go down to the next section addressing the city council and um, in, in letter C, it references the mayor and or council at their sole discretion may choose not to designate public speaking times for certain times. Everywhere in this document, it gives the mayor the sole authority to exercise their discretion about who gets to speak and when and how long and all that, which I think is completely fine. But in this section and in one other, a little bit later on, number three, section D, <clears throat> it also references something about the council. And so it's a little unclear whether, I mean, for instance, does that mean that the council can override the mayor or tell the mayor what they think they, the mayor should do, or do we want to reserve that authority solely for the mayor? So that's a, a question I have about that, the wording. So my, my read of this, which again, I, I got from another place, but as I looked at it and thought about it, it was that the, yes, the council could choose to say, we're not going to have public comment on this issue, or the mayor could say, we're not going to, and the council could say, but we want to. Um, so I think it was designed as a check and balance in case, so, you know, in the event that they weren't in sync, the mayor was trying to cut off debate and the rest of the council wanted to have it or the other way around. Uh, and then there was a place where, it, similarly, where it talked about the mayor could shut things down um, and it basically said if the mayor doesn't, the council can vote too. So again, it was just in case the majority of the council didn't feel that the mayor was properly running the business of the meeting. So I just took it as a check and balance of the system so that it didn't, it allowed the council to have input on this as well. Might I make a detailed rec uh, suggestion just as a meeting runner and stuff? I strongly sure, sure. suggest instead of the word mayor, you use the word chair. The mayor chairs the meeting, but the mayor isn't necessarily the only chair of the meeting. The, the president could be chair of the meeting, and presumably you'd want to vest that authority in whoever's chairing the meeting, not necessarily, you know, if the mayor's not there, the chair becomes disempowered. Right. So in the, in the uh, intent at the very beginning, it says wherever the word chair, the term mayor is used herein, it shall also mean the presiding officer of the board, committee, or task force, um, et cetera. So My, sorry about that. Okay. I'll shut up now. It's all good. Uh, Jack, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, responding to uh, to Carrie's point, the other thing that I would point out, uh, consistent with what Bill was just saying, is that uh, as a matter of parliamentary law, if the, if the chair makes a ruling, it is subject to challenge, and, and there can be a vote to either sustain or uh, overrule the, the ruling of the chair. So that... Uh, is provided for in Robert's rules. And so that I think is encompassed by the chair and council language. 
if I may, for the purpose of notes, uh, Councilmember Brown, I didn't hear fully, the sound in here isn't that great tonight. Um, I couldn't fully hear your comment about number five. I just want to make sure I got the notes right about the unwelcome physical conduct. It's Con contact. called contact, I should say, not conduct. Or, yeah, it's just that, uh, the, yeah, two different Staying words. It out loud okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, I um, also just want to note, uh, so when I read through this the first time as well, I also had a similar reaction to the, um, to the clothing section. Um, let me see if I can find where that is again. Um, yes, B7. yes, B7. Um, we could, uh, oh, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in what the council would like to do with that. I uh, could see us keeping it, well, I, I don't, I, I agree that we should not be specifying particular articles of clothing, um, but so I could picture taking that whole section out or modifying it in some way um, if you saw it fit. But, uh, any thoughts on that particular part? Yeah. I mean, has this issue ever arisen? Are we worried about it? I wonder if we could add it back in if it became an issue. It's like when I read it, I kind of thought it seemed a little like archaic, like some of our old things, like mm -hmm. be proper. And I'm like, it yeah. seems I've never seen it come up, and I don't know. <laughs> some of you have been around longer. Is there some? Is there a problem we're solving here? So maybe we just take it out. And I think it's fair to take it out for now. Um, and if it comes up, we'll add it back in. Yeah. Is that, if, if, uh, does that work for you, Carrie? Yeah, it does. I think it can be eliminated. Great. Okay, so <clears throat> I've got three changes so far, taking out the seven, the typo, and what was the third thing you said, Carrie? Oh, um, not a change, but just a clarification about the oh. mayor versus the council okay. having authority right. to do things. And, and I think that, you know, Jack's point about um, the council always being able to technically override the mayor is um, means that we're completely covered. So I think it's fine. Yeah. Uh, all right. So I'm going to go to the public now um, for comments. Anyone in person have a comment? Steve Whitaker, again, uh, I have not seen the policy. Um, I think that this should be handled uh, similar to an ordinance. It has the potential to impact the rights of citizens and their uh, ability to participate in the process. And it should probably be handled with a public hearing or two and a lot more public notice and printed copies available to be looked at. Um, it's pretty far reaching and I know you're with your two minute shenanigans, you're quick to override people's rights under open meeting law. So uh, I, that's pretty much my comments. Without having seen it, I can't provide tonight informed uh, comments on the d details. It was posted with the agenda on Friday. That's insufficient. Um, that's, uh, you've spoken out of turn a second time, Stephen. Um, so I just would like to note that one of the, I'm gonna point out a, a section um of the uh of this post oh we haven't oh, okay i will we'll do that we'll do that in a bit um okay oh, uh zach go ahead uh zach hughes uh from prospect street montpelier again i um i know i serve on a body and we're struggling with this so what i heard from my body uh from the uh committee i'm on uh and uh, was they were concerned about, and uh, just be cautious as you pass this, that you're not closing out uh, situations of commentary, that you're open. And I appreciate the mayor uh, being open to flexibility on certain situations with a two minute rule, um, because that's necessary sometimes. I, I also, um, I'm very skeptical about, and I'm sure you guys will get rid of it tonight, but. The clothing thing, really, we kind of, you know, that that to me is too. This isn't Florida, so uh, not yet. 
Um, but I appreciate that. I just want to urge caution. Um, I appreciate that the uh, city attorney did look at this. So, so um, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in person? Okay, well, there's a couple folks uh, with us digitally. So I'm going to go uh, Peter Kelman first. Go ahead. Peter Kelman, uh, Montpelier. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, again, a, a caution. I have read it. Um, and the portions that deal with uh, verbal behavior are obviously somewhat subjective um, and as they, as they must be, um, but it's, it's not going to make the problem go away. It, it, it's going to be a tough one. So I, I, I think that Zach's point about flexibility is a good one. Um, and uh, certainly Mayor Watson, you've been very, uh, very good about, about that. And uh but I'm not sure that this policy is going to make life any easier. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, go ahead, Linda Berger. Yes, thank you. I have one comment and one question. The question is, how does this mesh with the meeting logistics um, section on the agendas? Um, specifically, and this gets to my comment, uh, the back and forth part, because on Basically, the general requirements kind of refer to comments, not questions. And sometimes if there are questions, there has to be a bit of a back and forth because the person is seeking clarification or answers. Yeah, the, it's always um, on, uh, the discretion of the, the chair and the mayor. Um, but the idea is that you would ideally have all of your, your questions and comments together. And if it says um, comments, I, I, my interpretation of that is that's a, like an umbrella word that might be questions uh, and comments uh, sort of together, but we could clarify that to, to say questions and comments. Um, Donna, go ahead. Is it a bit different when it's a general appearance comment versus when we have a topic it's on the agenda and someone asked a question? I haven't treated it differently unless, I mean, there are times when people have asked questions where there's a, a quick sort of kind of answer and we could get right back into the comment. Um, but in general, I guess my preference would be to keep it all together um, unless folks have other thoughts. They are, they are addressed slightly different. I mean, oh, are the rules okay. are basically the same, but there are two yeah. different sections. And to, to the question Ms. Berger just raised, it says direct com conversation between a member of the public and a council or staff member may only proceed with permission from the mayor. Okay. So it doesn't rule it out, but it's basically right. saying it shouldn't, it shouldn't be direct comments, should be to the mayor, but a person can respond uh, or, you know, with permission that can be allowed to be continued. Under general business, it's really, I think, intent, the intent is people just raise an issue. Obviously, if there's a question, if, in fact, it says at the end, Mayor, members of the council, manager, or other city staff may choose to respond to public comments during general business that appears are obliged to respond. A response from a city official does not open the issue for full discussion at that meeting. Right. Okay, great. All right, uh, Vicki Ann Lane, go ahead. Hi, um, I have a couple of things, one of them not having anything to do with this particular thing, which I'll do first. Uh, did you intend to not record this meeting because it doesn't appear to be recording? And um, and um, also, um, it would be kind of nice to, to actually see what you're looking at um, and talking about. So I went on and to the minute, the agenda packet and couldn't find it. So yeah, just curious, thanks. Um, thank you, Vicki. The uh, document is available uh, with the agenda, so you could theoretically go there and see the, the document that we are talking about. Um, any comments on the recording? It's working on it. Usually it records. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. this, this is always being recorded. Oh, that's true. That's fair. Okay. Um, recording in progress. 
So. All right. So I don't see anyone else uh, with us digitally, but does anyone else have a comment who has not spoken? Okay. I just have one oh yes. Offer. Yep. Go ahead. Because there's been a comment made twice tonight <clears throat> that um, restriction of the, the time is in violation of the public meeting law, and we have looked at that. Uh, the public meeting law says that a public will be given a reasonable opportunity to express its opinion on matters as long as order is maintained. It doesn't say that it's unlimited and it doesn't say, it says public comment shall be subject to reasonable rules established by the chairperson. That's actually in the statute. There is no requirement, and I'm not urging that you do this at all, but in fact, there's no requirement to allow public comment on any agenda item. You can have, it is a meeting of the public. The law allows that the public may attend and watch and listen and pay attention. It's a meeting of the council. A meeting of the council or whatever the committee might be. And it's here to do public business. You certainly can choose to, and it's been a long tradition here in Montpelier that we do that, and I certainly would hope that we would continue to do that because, but for example, our school board takes all its public comment at the beginning of the meeting on any topic and then proceeds to their meeting without any further public comment. The Burlington City Council does the exact same thing. So there's no requirement that we have any comment on every item at all. So to the extent that we permit it, um, the law is very clear that it can be subject to reasonable rules established by the chairperson. And that's really, I think, what we're doing here, only having the full council. To, and you don't have to adopt these at all if you don't want to. but. Um, it is uh, it's incorrect to say that there's a certain entitlement to speak at public meetings. You have an entitlement to attend, to listen, and to have the records. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, Jack, go ahead. I think this is uh, this is a challenging uh, task because we're trying to balance a few different things. On the one hand, the, uh, the message to the public uh, is and, uh, and has always been and should be that we want to hear you, we want you to attend, and we want you to participate. And we want to uh, make sure that that can be done. And we're, nobody's, this policy does not propose to change that. Two is we clearly have a need to, in doing the public business, maintain uh, maintain order so we can get through all the work that we uh, we have before us. And so I think the question is whether whether we think this uh, proposed rules of conduct uh, reaches the correct balance of those. Uh, of those interests, and I, and I think it does. Yeah, fair enough. I, I also appreciate the um, part uh, that says that if someone is removed from a meeting, that they may still make comments um, via writing. Like that's that is certainly welcome as well. Any other comments, folks have? Okay, um, so. The suggested motion, for, yes, no, I thought you were. <laughs> the suggested motion is to uh, approve the rules as uh, per the proposed draft, but we do have some amendments. So, um, is there a motion? I make a motion that we pass this or this rules Policy. of conduct at public meetings with the amendments as given to us. So the amendment would be changing conduct to contact in number five, removing number seven in its entirety and renumbering. Okay, motion in a second. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Carrie, was that an aye? Yeah, okay, <laughs> okay, great. Thank not. you. I, I was unable to unmute myself. I uh, very good. Thank you. <laughs> um, all right. So I'm also going to interpret that these rules are going into effect immediately, um, unless folks would like that to go in, them to go into effect the next meeting. What uh, thoughts on that? Yes. Well, I feel they so follow what we've tried to put out as a standard of behavior that I feel it's totally acceptable that we follow them from this point on. Okay, great. Okay, 
we will go with that then. Okay, um, I I'm gonna we're gonna keep going then. Fair enough. Uh, so we are on to uh, the uh, city of Montpelier's uh, policy for energy in uh, municipal buildings. Um, this policy uh, is attached, however, um, the, uh, so I don't want to speak for you, Bill, but um, in conversation that I had uh, with our city manager, um, expressed the interest to have a little bit more time on this to make some, um, uh, to collect staff comments. and. So um, I guess my question for you all is, um, do we want to pursue <clears throat> um, the, the time that it would take to, uh, for staff to actually do that research? Well, to be just a little- Sorry, clear, yes, no, please. It was just a point of clarification. It wasn't just staff comments. Yeah. Um, the, the policy, which you know, is fine, is it, it proposes that all uh, buildings will be uh, fossil free by 2030 and it seemed to me that in the interest of good governance that we should have an inventory of which buildings those are and what needs to happen to make those you know, at least estimated costs to do that so that if we were adopt the policy we knew what we were taking on and over what period of time and that kind of thing so i i suggested to the mayor that if there was interest in the council to, in going forward with this then we would do that research and get back and so that people could make this decision, the public could have this conversation, um, knowing what the policy actually was. Yeah. Right well, yeah. Well, and what it would require. Right. Right. Yeah. Basically. Um, so, thoughts? Are you are we interested in pursuing that? At least investing that time. Yeah, I think it makes sense to get that information and then take it up at a future meeting. Okay. Other comments? I'm seeing nods. Okay, great. Okay, great. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, all right, so uh, while even though it's here, we will take this up at another time. Um, do you have a sense of how much time you think it will take? Though? I don't yet. I don't yet because we've got to figure out how many buildings. You know, some like these three buildings here are already on district heat. We've got, you know, pellet stove at the senior center. We're about to change the the public works garage to either pellets or methane. I assume we would not consider the rec building until we know what the future of that is. So, you know, we may not have that many left, but I think we just need to figure out which ones are left. And I know that the net zero report uh, did talk about this a little bit. So I think it's getting an inventory and then figuring out to see if there's a quick resource about what the best replacement is and then how to cost that. So it shouldn't be too terribly long. It may not be next meeting. Okay. All right. Good to know. Uh, Lauren. Um, just a um, timely update. Just today, the Vermont legislature passed um, a bill that will uh, create a grant program for municipalities for up to $500,000 for approved projects for weatherization, thermal efficiency to supplement or replace fossil fuel heating, heating systems with more efficient renewable or electric heating systems. So it's exciting to see the state offering some support to municipalities to do this kind of work. Um, and I very much support moving forward with this. I think it's the kind of thing we have to be doing if we're serious about our net zero commitment. Thanks. Great. And then, to be clear, I don't think we have staff that have any concerns with the goal. It's just we should do it with eyes wide open. Yeah, fair enough. Okay. Um, uh, Peter Kelman, I see your hand there. Go ahead. Is this is this being tabled or is this being discussed? Uh, well, we're discussing whether or not to take it up. So uh, if you have comments about it, that's OK. <laughs> Thank I, you for asking. OK, just a, a, a little bit related to what Lauren just said. Um, as most of us have been following the heating standard debate, the issue of fossil fuels versus um, carbon producing fuels is an important one that, as you say, if we are to be serious about our commitment, I really wonder whether we should be looking beyond just fossil fuels. I mean, bio, biofuels like, like uh, pellets still produce carbon dioxide. And, they, and to produce them, we're removing trees, we're removing vegetation, I know it's an extreme position, but it's a position I think deserves discussion. Thank you. Thank you. And we can talk more about that, I think, when we 
bring this up again, but um, thank you for, for raising that. Um, anyone else have comments, either in person or virtually? Okay, so we are going to move on then. And so we are up to the presentation from the Vermont River Conservancy. And, and I see Ricarda online. Oh, I am here. Here you are. <laughs> Go ahead. Great, thank you. Um, can I share a screen? I, I, are we working? Yes. Oh, yes, you can, apparently. If you can't, let us know. Okay. I'm really sorry that this isn't on the big screen. Um, <laughs> okay, are folks, are, can you see the, um, the slide? Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. Well, thank you. I'm Ricarda Erickson, the Deputy Director at Vermont River Conservancy, and I am here tonight excited to provide you all with an update on the progress for planning around the Confluence River Park. And here it is pictured at the um, confluence of the main stem and the north branch of the Winooski River as they flow right through um, downtown Montpelier and you can see on the um, transit center um, property there. That is the, the future Confluence River Park. And to, for tonight's update, I just bulleted, it, it'll be a, a brief update with a little bit of the history and kind of a timeline of where we're at. Um, I'll review some key funding sources, latest activity and news, and talk about what's next, and then can answer any questions. And so for the brief history, what I really want to highlight is this project from the beginning, when we first started talking about it in um, 2017, was really a community um, project and we received feedback from the community in the in the end of 2018 and all throughout 2019 we had 17 different community events and meetings in which we solicited feedback on what people wanted to see um, in, in a Riverside Park in downtown Montpelier. And we had pop-up events like this, Plan Your Park, where people got to look at the different potential conceptual designs and vote on which one they liked best and what features they liked. And so it was a very um, robust, community input period. And um, for those of you who attended those events, I thank you for, for your input. And um, I see this slide got cut off a little bit, but all that community input and the during the conceptual design phase really helped us build a uh, conceptual design with our uh, landscape architect and engineer from um, Malone and McBroom, who are still working with us now, um, and came up with this final conceptual design. And um, we actually have this, this design is now on a sign at the Confluence River Park. So any of you can, can go check it out and look closely at the details. Um, it's also on the Vermont River Conservancy website. So, this conceptual design was completed at the end of end of 2019 and presented to the council at the beginning of 2020. And, um, and then of course, 2020 um, kind of put a, a, a pause on a lot of the activity that we were planning for the Confluence Park. And, but in that meantime, we picked up on fundraising and worked with, um, we had, we started out with funding from Canada Charitable Family Trust through Vermont River Conservancy for the conceptual design phase. And then we worked with the city to, uh, to secure a land and water conservation fund grant, downtown transportation fund, and 
we were also we also received community support. Um, I think my next picture. Yep, the next picture here I wanted to show because it really demonstrates the community support around this project because this sign that you see here that you can see at the um, park site now was funded by AARP and the Unitarian Church of Montpelier. And, um, and then it was uh, completed and installed by um, Alec, the parks director and a, um, a youth crew here so really um in 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 funding and in um engagement this has really been a park a community a community effort here and um that really brings us so from from 2020 to um we, we spent a lot of time on fundraising and planning. And then when, once we were able to get underway again with um, the next phase, we, we kicked that off with um, SLR, which is formerly Malone and McBroom. So still working with Roy Schiff, an engineer who's local um, um, from Montpelier and um, a landscape architect um, who was Regina Leonard, who was also on the conceptual design phase. And so the current phase has been also focused on community engagement. And I just wanted to call out the, the focus group work that we've been doing. We have been working with our advisory committee, um, which is comprised of 19, um, ver mostly local, but some statewide members. And then we do have one um, River Riverside Park specialist from Colorado, who's also on the advisory committee. And the advisory committee has been leading focus groups. So talking, gathering um, specific audiences and asking them questions about what they want to see at the park and how they see um, themselves um, interacting uh, with the park and to help us fine tune the conceptual design to get it to a point in which it is shovel ready and in which we are not losing any pieces that are important to different potential user groups and visitors of this park. So that fo the focus group work has been really, um, really helpful and um, has helped guide some of the design features that we are um, fine tuning now. And I just wanted to highlight uh, these bullet points here um, because I think they're very pertinent to, to the council and to, to the city in terms of what has, what has come up um, uh, frequently at these focus groups. And maintenance will be critical. And that is something that um, has come up again and again. And once we have this beautiful park with lots of activity and, and people visiting it, we will need to make sure that we have um, a plan and uh, resources in place for maintaining the park. Connectivity to the park is also really important um, for parking and pedestrians alike. Um, inclusivity for differing physical abilities and lived experiences. And we, Vermont River Conservancy has had a commitment to accessibility for this park from the beginning and, and the city has shared that, that priority. And what we have identified throughout the focus group process is we wanna make sure, it's a, it's a small space, this park, and we wanna make sure that what we are creating is um, our spaces that feel welcoming for a variety of um, physical abilities. And so we have, so that has helped us um, fine tune the ADA accessibility path and to ensure that it's not just checking the, um, requirements for ADA accessibility, but that it's fun and welcoming and that um, it can be enjoyed by all abilities. So that is something that we're really focused on. Um, 
considering the need for swift water rescue, what would that look like? I just want to put that out there as something to discuss in the future as we are developing a um, really incredible um, uh, boat launch. And we want people to be able to access the water, um, the flowing water here. And we it's something that I think could be important to look into, to consider what would what would that look like to have swift water rescue in the area. Um, and then lastly, programming. Uh, you can see on in this picture, this is um, one of um, one of many focus groups that we had on site where we um, set up a table and, and asked people questions as they walked by. And we had this little flip chart and people could write down ideas of what they wanted to see at the park. And what came up again and again was programs. You know, people mentioned, wouldn't it be great if there was a yoga class here in the park or um, food trucks nearby and we could come in and have, sit and have lunch um, at the park. So programming is, is an important consideration and um, to help make this space vibrant um, and community oriented. And then um, just two more slides here. The um, current design work summary just in a nutshell, uh, we are, as I mentioned, refining the, the design based on um, both community input as well as the geotechnical work we've been doing. Some of you may have seen machines there. We've, we've done a couple different days of soil borings where we're looking into, you know, in deep into the soil and, um, and then also looking at the structural integrity of the area and how um, how we can, knowing that we will need to make some space for the, the path and the boat launch, et cetera, and what will this area be able to withstand. Um, so that's what this, this um, image just shows some of that overlay and um, design work that's happening. That's not quite as, um, uh, it's, it's a harder story to tell than, than the focus group work we're doing, but that's, that's a critical part of this current phase is kind of ground truthing um, what this space can, can maintain. And lastly, um, can't forget about the water um, in this phase where so this this picture shows how um, the engineering work that we're doing, which is looking at the different water levels and um, the high water marks and the, the low water marks and thinking about how can we create a space that um, knowing that at times some of the park might be covered underwater and um, doing the, the design with that in mind and um, you know keeping a close eye on the, the engineering aspects of the of the park. Um, so so this this slide just shows the the different um, watermarks and and how we can, you know, knowing that it might um, it might flood at times and we need to make sure that we have a, a floodable, <laughs> um, adaptable park. Um, so I believe that is the end there. So I will stop um, sharing my screen and um, any questions? Yeah, uh, Lauren, go ahead. Um, just on that last point, I know there's been conversation about looking into removing some of the dams around town. Is that being considered in the engineering or do you anticipate clear impacts or are, are there any problems there that we should be aware of um, related to that? Great question. Yes. Um, right now, the, the design, the conceptual design and the design we're working on right now are specifically for the terrestrial park. Um, but in um, kind of, we're trying in, in parallel, but it's somewhat, the timing may not work perfectly, but yes, considering the in-river features is, is critical. And um, 
we are working on funding for um, dam removal studies and what that would look like for the um, different dams in Montpelier that are particularly there are two right nearby that would impact the the water flow and the in river opportunities um, at the park. So those are that's a big part of the conversations that um, the advisory committee is having and the and it's definitely on um, it's on the front burner in in design discussions in in relation to the the terrestrial park. Other questions from the council? Then we'll go to questions from the public. Uh, Jack, go ahead. Well, since uh, since Lauren stole my question, uh, I, I'll just have a comment, which is that I think this is uh, this is looking great. You know, all around the Northeast, we see uh, cities that uh, are built around rivers because of the industrial use of the river for power, and uh, it's great that we're able to move past that and make the uh, move more along the lines of making the riverfront a uh, place that's an attractive uh, location for outdoor re recreation. So I think this is going to be really exciting. Yes. Agreed. Other comments or thoughts? Anyone from the public? Donna, go ahead. I'll just say it's very exciting and to see you even expand over <clears throat> on the area by the transit center is just terrific. Well, thank you. And thank your crew. Yeah. Peter Cullen, go ahead. I'm able to unmute myself. Oh, there we are. Okay. Um, yeah, <clears throat> this does sound exciting. I wonder if you all have thought about some other changes that have happened recently. Um, I walked through Confluence Park uh, the other day and saw a number of people who used to hang out at um, the Guerton Park at the picnic table talking. I sat down and had a nice chat with them. They seem very comfortable there. Is that picnic table gonna remain? As you said, it's a very small space. And as it says, we wanna be uh, uh, open to people with varied life experiences. And uh, one of the things that came out in the Guertin Park conversation was to try to make that, that area right in downtown something that would be a comfortable place for both people who are unhoused and people who aren't to share. And it'd be great if this could be designed in such a way that it could be shared among all kinds of people in Montpelier. It's a very small space. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that, Peter. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's absolutely um, in, in, a part of the conversations in in this um, design and, and planning phase. Um, we are very much aware of 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 those concerns and and considerations and want it to be um you know a, a park for the people um and so it's that's absolutely um i would say top top priority is um conversations around um how can we in such a small space in the heart of downtown um provide a an opportunity for a variety of, of user groups to enjoy a space and how can we have it such that um, not one use overwhelms another use and so it's um i am really uh happy that we have a, a a lot of expertise on our team between the um 
the the advisors and and our and our design team um, have a lot of experience in in that regard. And so and it has been and that's why we wanted to do focus groups. We just wanted to just really sit down with folks um, yeah, via Zoom and go over the design and hear ideas and and also, you know, at the at the park itself. Um, so that's it's a it's a great point. Uh, Carrie, go ahead. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. I'm I'm kind of following up on that that same point and that same question. I'm very glad you're thinking about it. I think it's um it's top of mind to a lot of folks looking at this small space, and um, it seems that it has the potential for any small group of folks to and and or or, or any one kind of use to kind of dominate it and make it feel less welcoming and inviting to other people. Um, so I'm glad to hear that you've got a lot of expertise. I wonder if you have any more specifics about um, how you see that playing out and um, how, because I, and if you have any examples of other small parks or small public areas where there has been success in sharing. Um, I've done a little bit of looking around at this myself. I'm not an expert though, so I haven't really found much. So I'm wondering if you have any any more concrete information about that. Mm -hmm. um, well, what I mean, one thing I'll say a few things here. One is um, I think this uh, the community engagement is is critical, and and that um, is a piece that I. Um, I value in it. I think it helps, it helps us get a sense of what, how people want to use at the park. And it also, it also gives a sense of ownership and, um, just a, a community ownership of a space. And so, for example, when, when I was at the park doing a focus group, um, you know, we, we were able to speak with those experiencing homelessness, as well as the, you know, passersby who, you know, runners or, you know, someone pushing their stroller. So we were able to capture a, a broader audience. And one thing that was that came up was, you know, the the maintenance piece, for example, like who who's going to take care of this? And we had, you know, a, a number of suggestions. The People being like, well, what if, what if community members took care of it? What if there were, you know, what if, um, you know, people who, you know, by by helping to take care of it and by being engaged in the process, there there is a, a greater sense of um, community ownership, and I think that's that's one critical piece. Another is we are working, we, we are working with examples from around the country um, of, of um, you know, municipalities and, and organizations who have worked with a variety of, of user groups in, in creating these parks. And so there, there's some literature that we're referring to. Um, AARP and 880 cities just came out with a, um, a really fantastic resource for that. Um, and what they talk about is, is having design that's um, not, not hostile design, not, not in, not having any design features that um, prevent certain like, specific uses. Um, and so anyways, this, that has been really helpful. And, um, and then we've been collaborating with, um, organizations throughout the state who, who are doing this kind of work, um, whether it's, um, you know, Vermont adaptive in regards to inclusivity with, um, physical differences, um, as well as AARP has been a great partner in this. So, I'd say, Carrie, those are the three <laughs> top three things I, I can offer now. And um, and uh, yeah, if you want any specifics, I'm happy to provide them. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, Jennifer, go ahead. Hi. Um, I would, this is my two cents. I would um, highly recommend looking at cities like Portland, Oregon and Seattle, Washington um, and how they've managed 
little parks and whatnot on their riverfronts um, for a variety of community members. Yes, absolutely, Jennifer. Yeah, there's um, I there's a lot of examples out west and of, of riverside and river centric cities and um, there's not a lot of examples out east and I feel like Montpelier could really we could be the example, um, which I think is very exciting that um, we have these opportunities, not just with the Confluence River Park, but also, as Lauren mentioned, with potential dam removal and opening up a whole um, corridor of, of our rivers for um, for our community and, and visitors to enjoy. And that, I think, is is a pretty um, it, it, it could be transformative and it could put Montpelier as the the area that people are looking to as an example. I have a question uh, related to maintenance, which you mentioned. Uh, have, uh, have you been in touch with Alec, who I think would ultimately be, uh, if, uh, this being a park, it would be under uh, sort of his uh, auspices or domain or whatever. Um, so, do you or or Bill? Do you have a sense of uh, whether there well has there been any, any conversation about the need for extra staffing to provide maintenance for that space? And I, I'll add one other thing, which is that I, I'm really glad that you mentioned the the low and high levels of the water, and that some of that space may flood. And I also can envision. Uh, the water levels rising and the water levels falling and when it falls there being like a layer of <laughs> silt <laughs> or <laughs> something that needs to maybe be cleared out. Um, so anyway, I'm wondering if you can speak to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I see. Yeah, great question. Anna. I see, I see that Alec is um, is in this meeting as well. And and I I also I, I did want to just I, say how um, how great it's been working with Alec and as well as Kevin Casey on, on this project. And um, I, I think that uh, we, as a Montpelier resident also, I feel extremely lucky that we have um, such, um, such competent and um, just incredible work um, by Alex. So I just, I did want to just give kudos to him on that. And, um, and yes, we've been meeting, VRC has been meeting with Alec and Kevin for every twice a month. Um, and so we're, we've had many conversations about maintenance and, and what, what that might look like, but, you know, as well as design elements and things that are coming up um, with our conversations with our design team. Um, so those communications have been um, frequent yeah. with um, city staff and um, and the design team and VRC and no solution or plan identified yet, but now is the time to be having those conversations of what it will look like and consider, you know, future budget Im implications and um, and it, it and whether it might mean adding, you know, staffing for for maintenance. Fair enough. Thank you. Um, any other? Oh, Alec, do you want to speak to that at all? Sure, I can jump in on a couple of things. Thanks. Thanks, Ricarda. Um, about um, staffing, I think that, you know, even before Confluence Park arrives, we, we had already identified the bike path, you know, the recreation path and some of our downtown areas as a place that needs better maintenance. I think it's something that, um, you know, we did a great job building it, but didn't ever really delegate someone to manage it. Um, and we talked about that as a team um, in the last budget Congress and it just, you know, there's so many priorities. It didn't percolate up to the top to have um, that kind of maintenance um, dedicated to our downtown. But, you know, maybe Confluence Park will tip the scales. Um, we as a department have always, you know, focused on the trails and the trees and all the other things we do. We don't have like a sort of, well, we called it an urban ranger position, uh, which was borrowed from Burlington. Um, but I think that would be a great seasonal position. Um, 
So I'll put in a plug for that. I hope that's not out of line, Bill or Cameron. Um, I don't, I won't be seen as lobbying for anything, but I, it, it's already been identified. And, um, you know, I think whether or not we fund it, it's a good idea. Um, yeah. And then the other piece I wanted to talk about was about um, Carrie's question. Uh, are there other examples? I think we could actually look at ourselves, I think, as a good example. Um, with the rest of our parks, we developed this whole policy um, in relationship with the outreach worker that we have, um, you know, of folks who are camping in the park or using, oh, I missed, send me. Um, that we've developed a way to, um, you know, have relationships with people and have a connection to people in the homeless community to help, you know, people find resources and, I feel like we, we often point to the Girton gazebo example as something that wasn't working great, but that was, that was very ad hoc. Um, you know, we didn't have this position in to like develop relationships with folks there and maintain it frequently as opposed to Confluence park, which is incredibly well-planned and, you know, hopefully by the time it gets implemented, we have a, that a similar thing in place that we have in our existing parks now, which from my perspective is working well. Oh, and can I add one more thing? Sorry. <laughs> um, we recently, uh, there was a question about dam removal. Um, and I just wanted to add on top of what Ricardo said, we, the city was awarded a VOREC grant through the state. Um, it was about outdoor recreation and economic development. Um, it was a little more than $200,000. And a small piece of that was um, some design work for the in water features of Confluence Park. And we already had some ARPA money set aside or some reserve capital fund set aside for dam removal study. So we're gonna um, combine those and look to put out an RFP for somebody that can both look at what, what would it look like to remove the dam, you know, be structurally sound, safe for the river and those downstream, and also have in, in river whitewater features. and. To my surprise, there are like multiple firms that do that work. <laughs> so um, that's that's on the to-do list and hopefully will yield some good results. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? I guess I have only one more, um, which is, uh, I assume we'll be talking about this again at some point or we're gonna to need to touch base about it. Do you have a sense of like when that might be or what will trigger that? I think, um, so this conversation has been moved back a couple times. I think this, we initially planned this for shortly after the town meeting vote, just, you know, once we knew where the bond was, and then for a combination of our, our agendas and uh, Ricardo's agenda, here we are in early May talking about it. I would think that um, when there's, I don't know if there's a specific time, I think we would be, when there was maybe a decision point or a key update that we have a steering committee and I, you know, we're in pretty good touch with Ricarda and with Alec. Um, I think there'd be a sense of it's time to come back to the public, maybe when we have, uh, you know, some, some key decision. point that's going forward. Great. Well, thank you, uh, Ricarda and Alec. Uh, thank you for all of your work on this. This is, it's very exciting. Great. Thank you all. Nice that bookcase at a council meeting again. <laughs> <laughs> And sorry, we pushed it back a couple times. Thank you for your flexibility. <laughs> okay. All right, so I think we are ready to move on. Okay, so the, the next uh, item is uh, the uh, Social and Economic Justice Committee's stipend policy, and I saw. Oh, Shana has turned her uh, camera on. Hello, Shana. I'll, I'll turn it over right to you. Hi. Thanks so much for having us. Um, yeah, my name is Shana Casper. I'm chair of the Montpelier Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee. Uh, we are I live on Kent Street, um, and we are established in 2018 to assist the City Council in addressing and reshaping the systems and policies and practices that perpetuate barriers to racial, economic, and, um, and other just injustices in our community. And so we went through a 18 month long process with consultants at Creative Discourse about how to make our city operations more equitable and just. 
And one of the main uh, actionable, like immediately actionable recommendations was to provide stipends for participation in city committees and task force um, and things like that to ensure more uh, opportunity for diverse representation among participants. We know that these stipends are critical to compensate people for their time, as well as offering assistance for childcare and food and transportation and other needs that folks might need to be able to volunteer their time to attend these meetings. And to continue our work implementing the city's equity assessment and in line with our strategic plan that the city recently adopted, um, back in December, we received $30,000 budget line item for FY23 for these stipends um, with a request to have, provide an update for how we wanna propose to use it. So that's what I'm here to do today. So Montpelier has 23 active city committees with about 155 non-unique volunteer members um, holding about 250 meetings a year. And so these are the volunteers that make our city run. Um, and we proposed a couple of different offerings when we first brought this back in December and um, in cost of conversations decided to go with a uh, first come first serve $50 stipend for any and all committee members who want, who request it, who want to fill it out. So city committee members, um, there's a couple of stipulations around this. So city committee members are, can't be employees or on any committee that already receives a stipend. So like city councilors, um, and want to receive a stipend for their participation in a committee. Folks will have to fill out a W9 form, um, to be able to be kind of reimbursed. Um, it only also, only others also stipends regular meetings. So not subcommittee meetings or things like that. And so if they're part of more than 12 meetings a year, more than $600, the finance department will issue a 1099 um, for, for tax purposes. Um, and once that $30,000 is allocated, participants will be notified and will no longer be able to receive the stipend. Um, and for committee members who are not part of the stipend process, the only new thing that's gonna have to happen in order to make open up this new equity opportunity is um, that a staff rep or the chair of the committee will need to submit, uh, complete and submit an attendance record for after each meeting um, or on a monthly basis, whichever is um, less frequent. So, um, and that is also attached in the, in the um, materials. Um, and so finally, we're asking us all city current, we, we wanna track how, how this works and how we're doing, we recognize this is a pilot program. And so we're asking all current city committee members to participate in a pre and post survey process for this year. So to see how effective it is at getting more members with more you know, racial and socially and economically diverse um, backgrounds onto different city committees. So we hope to do this as a one year pilot project and then evaluate how many stipends were used on what committees, how people heard about it and just survey that effectiveness. So like allowing, uh, seeing how effective a stipend is at allowing more types of people to participate in these community committees um, in our community. So um, we can make a more robust kind of budget proposal and analysis of how this worked um, probably for you know more likely 2025 to see how effective it all is. Um, we'll also just keep track of the number of applications we have generally um, and the number of vacancies that we have on committees um, pre and post stipends as well. So um, we'll also just start tracking voluntarily shared demographic information about who is applying for these volunteer positions. Um, so that's kind of the information that I wanted to report back and see if there's any questions, but also wanting to use this opportunity to hope that anyone, everyone can help get the word out about this. We really hope that, you know, uh, you know, offering these stipends is not enough. It's about making sure that folks who aren't already a part of city committees or um, haven't been able to participate because of these financial barriers, that this can just be one small, small way to support and encourage folks who may have felt like they couldn't participate in Montpelier civic life, um, you know, a way to really take meaningful action. So let me pause there, um, yeah, to see if there was any, any questions or other additional comments. Well, I've got some questions. I think this is great, by the way. I'm so glad that you all were able to put this together. And of course, it has some legal implications about like having 1099s and, yep. and all that. I'm glad that you've worked that all out. That is wonderful. Um, so just a couple questions. Um, I saw the part about the attendance record and I help me understand why we need a separate attendance record as opposed to just using the minutes from a meeting because 
if I understand yeah. correctly, usually minutes include attendance, but maybe they're not detailed enough. I don't know, but I, I thought I'd put that out there to you. This was recommended by this Essex city, um, which just implemented these. And it was, it's really a, a matter of, you know, intention and impact or implement, uh, implementation of, you know, recognizing that there's the, you know, intention of timely turnings of, of, of getting the minutes in and approving them and everything else. But um, that sometimes that can take a couple of months and wanting to make sure that people get the stipends um, as soon after the, the meeting as possible um, in order to make sure that we kind of know where in the budget we are and everything else. Sure. So makes sense. Um, and I have one other comment, uh, which is under the eligibility section um, number 2B, City of Montpelier Council members, any board, commission or task force members, um, well, we receive stipends. I, I think it's probably just also worth mentioning the mayor because sometimes mayor is included in the council and sometimes it's not. And so um, just to make it abundantly clear that the mayor is also not eligible for this. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> not, not um, that is it for me. Other thoughts or questions? Donna, go ahead. Well, I put this section in the wrong policy. This is what I was talking about. The on number two that Anne just referred to, C, any subcommittee, another exemption would be any subcommittee meeting. The pilot will only reimburse for attendance at regularly scheduled meetings. Don't you mean at regularly scheduled committee meetings? It's the core committee, right? Not the subcommittee. And when I read it, just I sort of stumbled there. I wanted to know that the regular scheduled, you could have a subcommittee regularly scheduled for a while. So could you reinsert the word the committee, regularly scheduled com committee meetings? I'm not totally following where you are, but I, I that it makes was sense just where Ann was. He, she was on, on two under eligibility. Yep. So exemptions from stipends program. And you're excluding subcommittees, which means makes total sense with me. Um, but it's just the explaining that you're only reimbursing for attendance at regularly scheduled meetings. And maybe you meet it differently. Maybe you mean if a subcommittee meets regularly, then they get a, a second stipend. I was reading it that they don't get a stipend for a subcommittee. So help me understand what you intended. Yeah, I believe that is the intention. How I understand it at least is it is just for regularly scheduled full member meetings, not subcommittee meetings. So we could potentially amend it to say, uh, uh, well, the full pilot, committee. yeah, committee, yeah, committee, yeah, committee just, meeting. Just add, just insert those. Is that the word committee in that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's all. That Thank you. Be, that would do it. It's a great document. You've covered a lot of detail. Uh, Carrie, go ahead. Sorry. Um, thanks. So just. On that last point, if you just kept it to say any subcommittee meetings, I think that would do it. Um, so that's just my suggestion for a wording change. Um, but my my other comment is, <clears throat> I think this is fantastic. Hooray. I'm so glad you're doing this. I think that people should get paid for their work whenever possible. And um, I am I'm I'm thrilled to be able to support this. I'm so glad we're doing it. And I'm I hope that it helps to meet the goals of increasing the diversity of the people who serve on committees. And I think it, it you know it does represent a barrier that people face in um, being able to serve on committees and task forces and stuff. But I think there are lots and lots of other barriers that people face. And so I'm I imagine you're not expecting this to be the the magic bullet that fixes everything. And I would just, I just want to make sure that we have appropriate expectations and um, what we call success. Uh, from my perspective, the fact that we compensate people even just a little bit for their time, even just to kind of help out with things like childcare or transportation, or just to remove a little bit of that hurdle, to me, that's a success right there. And if it also contributes to a larger effort to have a have greater access to committees and a greater, more diverse set of people serving, that's fantastic. But if it doesn't do that, I don't want us to call it a failure. You know what I mean? So um, I, I'm just 
fully supportive of this all the way around. That's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's also reminding me of one other comment that I wanted to make, which was um, in regard to your the survey that you're doing. I'm, I'm so glad that you're doing a sort of a pre and post uh, survey. Um, it seems to me that since we're starting it with the set of folks that have already signed up, um, one of the things that I would be interested in finding out is if this stipend helps prevent burnout. Uh, you know, does it help encourage people to stay on when they might otherwise drop out because they've found it to be too taxing? Um, so I, I guess I'm also wondering if, uh, I mean, obviously you all will be looking at that data, uh, but I guess you'll, you'll probably be presenting that to us when when you come back to, to talk about the results of this as a pilot. Yeah, and so that is, yeah, a couple of things I want to reflect back here is um, that, uh, uh, first of all, is that um, the way the budget timing works, like we pro we were implementing this in July, and so we won't be able to do the, like we want to see it through, and so we won't be able to have the results of this until at least after um, after July. And then also to note is that we don't have a lot of this um, baseline data of kind of who is on our committees now. And we're gonna try to do a bunch of outreach to make sure that current members um, know about this stipend that's happening and fill up the, the you know, kind of demographic survey beforehand, but that, um, uh, that we, you know, we're just getting, getting this information, being able to collect this information and asking these questions is gonna be really valuable. Um, and so, and, and kind of changing our policies and practices about when people apply, being encouraged to fill out demographic, you know, the demographic survey and things as well. Um, I think those are the only two things, just bring them out of order. So. Any other comments or questions for Shana and from the public either? Yes, go ahead. Uh, Peter Kalman, Montpelier. Um, I, I just want to build a little bit on what Carrie just said. Uh, the, ne the next steps besides paying people is getting people to apply, getting people to even know that there's openings, getting people to um, understand what it means. I think we, we need to do a better job of outreach a really outreach specifically when we have committees that we know impact people who ordinarily don't participate, that we try to get them to join. Um, I was on the uh, CJAC in its founding, and we did a good job of recruiting, but we lost the diversity very quickly because it was too demanding for their lives. And we should have been clearer about that from the outset. It's not just getting, you know, a person of color on there, for example. You gotta look at the whole picture. So I hope this is the beginning of an effort that will succeed. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else in person? Okay, anyone else uh, virtually wish to make a comment? Uh, David Delcor, go ahead. Yeah, just a question. Um, when you talk about attendance, are you talking about in-person attendance? Or, uh, in, I mean, I, I guess I want to be clear because I have to explain it. So, Yeah, great question. As a person who's immunocompromised and calling in from Zoom, this is really important. This is for participation full stop, whether that's in-person or virtual participation. So both. Okay. Any other questions, comments? All right, so I think we are at the point where we could have a vote. Uh, Lauren, go ahead. Thank you. Um, just, just a couple comments. Um, first of all, really excited to see this move forward. Um, all the work that the community did weighing in and hiring um, our consultants to work with us, Creative Discourse, and, um, you know, Following through on the implementations, I think, is so important, and not just having that be, um, you know, a report that we did or a process that we went through. So I'm really pleased and uh, grateful to see, um, you know, the community support in the budget and uh, moving this forward. 
Um, you know, a lot of times these kinds of things can hit walls when it actually involves putting money <laughs> into things. And so that is exciting to see that we're, um, you know, really taking seriously our commitment to equity um, and just really grateful for a ton of work has gone into it. It's, you know, one of these things where we were like, yeah, let's just do stipends. And then, of course, the, the complexity of figuring out all the details, Cameron did uh, amazing work pulling together, you know, how to make this actually work on the back end so we could get these out to people in a timely and as efficient as possible manner. Um, you know, and we very much on the committee uh, recognize that it's, um, you know, going to take, as Peter was pointing out, you know, it's it's the the outreach and, you know, whole suite of things, just having this available and people don't know about it and, you know, looking at other barriers and things, but really excited for this um, to move forward and really appreciated um, Carrie and a couple other people's comments about thinking about success. There was an example, we presented this to, um, we invited chairs from different uh, city committees to come learn about it and provide some feedback. And one of the participants, for example, um, said her term was going to end this summer and she was planning to step down because it had been, become a burden. And she was like, I, I think I'm gonna rethink. This actually makes it feel more possible for me to continue serving. So I do think that you know, as we look at wow. the, the reflection on it and thinking about questions we could ask um, membership of both retention and, you know, the ability for people to continue serving as well as bringing in new voices to the process um, could both be important. So I really appreciate that. Um, and I would move that we adopt the FY22, FY23 pilot stipend program policy with the amendments of under the eligibility for stipends um, number 2C um, to add in the phrase regularly scheduled full committee meetings. What did you think about Councilmember Brown's suggestion that you just take out everything after any subcommittee meetings? I think that could work too. I think the explanation might make it really clear for people, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but do people have a strong preference? Okay. <laughs> um, and then was there an amendment to add mayor to, yes. uh, and then also to add mayor to the list um, in 1A, any appointed and elected member of, oh, 2B? Oh, 2B, city council members. So it was mayor, comma, city of Montpelier, council members, et cetera. Okay, with a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? Oh yes, Jack, go ahead. As I was uh, listening to this discussion, I'm, I'm supporting, I'm voting for the uh, motion. As I was listening to this, I was, uh, the thought occurred to me about whether, I, I wouldn't want someone to feel hesitant or stigmatized for signing up to uh, get the stipend. I, I'm just starting to look at the public records law, but I would hope that we could come up with an interpretation that says that signing up to receive the stipend is a personnel record that would mean that it would not be a public record. I don't know if you have a thought about that. It's interesting. The, the payments certainly would be. Okay. Just like our all city employee payments are in the annual report. So I, I, I know this came up when we talked about it with Essex, and I don't can't find it in my notes immediately. But I do believe that they dealt with. We, that's how, why one of the reasons why we're doing it this way. Sorry to jump in, okay. uh, Lauren and then Donna. Uh, kind of in that vein, we did talk about um, how for the committees themselves. Um, the way that we want to do the process is that they're just submitting the the full list of attendants so it's not like identify people who are receiving the stipend so the committee members themselves don't need to know i mean if someone wants to foia it and do you know look at the public records but it wouldn't be you know handled that way so it would just be a full attendance list every time and the city staff who would be processing it would be the ones who um, would know which um, participants in the stipend program or attending each meeting uh -huh. Well, I would hope we would change the culture 
and that we get our little stipends and that we shouldn't feel guilty about getting our stipends as city council members. And we should be proud to get a stipends that we serve on committees. So I think it's up to all of us to change the language and the attitude that we deserve this little bit of stipend. Yeah, fair enough. Great. Um, any other comments? Okay, uh, there's been a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, and opposed. All right, uh, so that passes. Yay, thank you, Shana. Please pass along our gratitude to the rest of the committee. Yeah. Um, so well, I just want to say huge, huge thank you too to Cameron. I feel like this has just been a huge amount of work for her to make it happen and make it, um, you know, smooth sailing. So just, yeah, huge, huge thank you to Cameron. Yay. All right, thanks. Cameron. <laughs> Yay. And Shana, I'll be at graduation at your alma mater this weekend. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, super. All right, so we are up to the um, item, item about uh, housing task force, and I think we probably have a couple of folks here for that. Uh, so you're welcome to come on up to the table. Welcome. Thank you. So um, for those of you who I have in a microphone. Okay. Um, for those of you who I haven't met, I'm Polly Nickel, and I'm the current chair of the Montpelier Housing Task Force. Um, and this is actually uh, the first part of a two-part presentation. I'll be back later in the month uh, for more details on the housing situation in Montpelier. But um, the Housing Task Force has for the past 22 years been Montpelier's unofficial city housing committee. Um, it was actually started by what's now Down Street Housing and Community Development, and it's a group of volunteers, and um, we do have representation from city council members and support from city staff, but it's kind of been whoever wants to join, joins. And because of the seriousness of the housing situation in Montpelier now, we think that it is time for the city to create an official housing committee. Um, and um, we think it would make a statement about the importance of housing in Montpelier. Um, you all would be able to vet prospective members and you know figure out who you want on the committee and and um, and what skills and um, interests you want. And you could solicit membership to a wider community than we have. Um, so we put together a memo that I think you you got suggesting um, what some language for mission and operation. Um, these these were just thoughts that the housing task force had. Um, but the, what we would propose for purposes are to um, gather and evaluate housing related information. Um, to propose responses to housing concerns, uh, to recommend policies and programs to the city that meet the housing aspirations in the master plan, and to both educate um, the public and advocate for policies designed to increase the supply of housing, as well as affirmatively further fair housing, which is the second aspiration. Um, I'm not gonna go through our suggestions on committee operations, they're in the memo, they're things like, you know, who the committee could consult with, things like that. Um, but um, I did want to say we think that the committee should have between nine and 11 members um, appointed by the city council and that Montpelier residency um, should be preferred but not required because you business owner or somebody with a relationship to Montpelier who wasn't actually a, a city resident. Um, members should have a passion for housing issues, the time and willingness to work because um, it is a lot of work, be open-minded, creative, and compassionate, and whenever possible, have general work or housing-related skills or expertise. And we're not suggesting um, a committee of folks who you know, do housing professionally um, but that 
there be enough people on the committee um, with um, some technical skills so that the committee can do its work. Um, right now, two members of the Housing Task Force also serve on the Housing Trust Fund Advisory Committee, and that's in the, um, the policy for the trust fund. So we would propose that that carry over and, and two members of this new committee serve on the Housing Trust Fund Committee and that um, the staff support from the um, Community and Economic Development Specialist, the Planning Department and other departments continue. And, and um, that's, been, that's been really key uh, to have Kevin Casey um, when he was in that role as staff support um, to us. So um, simply, that's the recommendation. Um, and we think there would really be a benefit to the city to move in, in this direction and that there's certainly plenty of work for this committee to do. Super comments, thoughts, questions for Polly. Oh, OK, go ahead, Bill. Um, I, I, I've talked about this with our staff internally, I don't know if you had this conversation. The, it was my understanding that the, the Housing Trust Fund was created as a separate board because the task force was made up of a lot of people that might be applying for it. Right. And if that's not the case anymore, how is there thought about that you just have one committee sure. who recommends those and not have two groups? Yeah. Yeah, we hadn't, we didn't really talk about that, but it just might yeah. save on two sets of meetings right. and you know, <laughs> right. the people right. that are dealing with housing policy and issues can see who the proposals yeah. are. I mean, you still just recommend to the council anyway, so. Yep. Right. That seems like that might be worth looking into, but maybe not for today. You know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah. We, yeah, yeah, yeah. For a future, right. <laughs> potential future meeting. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. And the reason we wanted to bring this to you now rather than wait till the end of the month as we know you know setting up a committee and recruiting members will take time and um, as I said in the beginning given the importance of the um, housing crisis I think it's not an exaggeration um, in Montpelier it, it would be good to get going can you remind me how many people are on the housing task force right now <laughs> Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how many bodies show up? It, it depends on how many people are there at any uh, given meeting. There have been years where it's been like three or four of us. Uh, lately, it's been the range has really been more in the five to eight or so yeah. people coming okay. pretty regularly. Yeah. But you know, because it's 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 not an official body. There's no official membership so anyone who comes can basically say that they're a member of the task force okay yeah donna go ahead all this time i didn't know you weren't official <laughs> <laughs> so under that are there people now on the housing task force that are saying they're interested in serving i'm interested in some overlap you have such a wealth of knowledge of several of the members i i think so i mean you know, I haven't talked to, to um, everyone, and I've been urging um, people who are on to apply, and I, and I know at least a, a few people are going to, but I couldn't give you a count. Thank you. And thank you for your service. Yeah. I hope you signed up. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, 22 years. I done. know, but keep going. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh, other thoughts or comments? Council, from the public. Go ahead. Uh, Peter Kelman. <laughs> Needless to say, I'm strongly in favor of this. <laughs> um, I, I think it is quite important. I mean, I think you can tell from Jack's somewhat amusing answer. Nobody knows. Um, the Housing Task Force was an informal group. And the core of it, really, aside from Polly, the core of it were representatives of particular organizations. Uh, Downstreet, uh, uh, Good Sam, um, help me here, uh, uh, Montpelier Housing Authority, 
etc. <clears throat> um, so the, the votes, there weren't any votes because they weren't, you can't have a quorum. <laughs> I mean, we, we, had, we had consensus more than votes. And, um, and, and certainly it served its purpose a lot during the last 22 years. I wasn't here the whole 22 years, like, but I've heard, I've heard a lot of good things about, about, the, uh, about it. But I think it really does make a very housing committee for Montpelier, a real housing committee. And to have one that really can reach out, apropos of what you just passed in terms of um, the stipends, to reach out to the whole for some particular, and really recruit for some particular life experiences, some for, for some particular business uh, experiences, and, uh, and and to interact, for example, with the Montpelier <coughs> Energy Advisory Committee, because housing is not just a matter of how much it costs to buy a house, it's how much it costs to maintain a house, especially how to the cost to maintain a house that is not energy efficient. So I really see this as doing the full range from house ownership to rental to unhoused. And Paul, you, you, you didn't mention it, but it, it, the unhoused has been a very big focus of the housing task force. And I think would continue to be, even though we do have a homelessness task force with whom we would work, Having, again, having a committee, a real town committee that can make concrete proposals about, let's say, low barrier temporary housing, for example. So anyway, I, I, I think this is the time to do it, and it's going to it's going to take some time to get this started. Thanks. Thank you. Um, other comments from folks. Either, oh yeah, Jack, go ahead. I move that we create the Montpelier Housing Committee uh, composed of between nine and 11 members uh, to be appointed by the council, that the committee, the purposes of the housing committee be as set forth in, uh, in the memo that's been presented to us and that we um, start to recruit members. I'll second. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, looking forward to hearing more from you all. All right. It is only 817. Do you want to take a break now? Oh, you, you were like, you were like no, keep, we, should, you know, we should take a break now. Take a break now. Okay, so it is 8.18. We're going to take a 10-minute break. Be <laughs> back at 8.28. We'll see you shortly. I think we're up to the community survey, so I'm going to turn it over to Bill. Thank you. Um, so one of the things you approved in the budget and you've already approved the contract for was our whole contract with Polco and there's going to be a whole other piece about that that we'll introduce. But the main thing that we're getting from them is what's called the National Citizen Survey. And um, that's the, the copy of the draft surveys included in with the packet. We did this in 2009 and uh, have hoped to update it regularly since then, but here we are. <laughs> um, doing it again. Uh, ideally, you do this every couple of years and track the progress, and maybe we'll, we'll get back on to that. But um, most of it's pretty well set, it, you know, and part, part of the reason for being set is then you can get comparative data from other communities that do the survey, so you can see how, you know, we rank our services versus others. But there is like a half a page where you can put what's called custom questions, and they really need them I think first of next week we have a meeting in order to stay on the schedule that we have. So I, I drafted some uh, that I thought would be interesting, but this is kind of the council's chance to weigh in on, the, at the very least, topics. You don't necessarily draft the questions, but there are specific topics you want to try to get in. Um, I, I will say that for me, the, given all the emphasis we've talked about with, with communication, to me, the most important question I want to know is where are people going to get 
Perfect. and see what people respond because we make assumptions that people are getting it from here, there, or somewhere else. And then I just listed, you know, what's the top issue? There are other questions in there that kind of get at that. And then these were the four, the second four were just from their own recommendations of questions that other communities have used. Um, so I threw those in. But um, I would assume we're going to get maybe this is probably space for three. So if you have the input, I certainly didn't want to go ahead and put questions on without the council weighing in. Thoughts, comments? Um, yeah, Jack, go ahead. I think it's good to me. I think uh, I know, Bill, you wanted to get this, some kind of information like this for years, and we've, we've had a couple of years where it was, it fell off the budget right at the last moment, and so I'm glad we're getting this in. I think uh, I support doing it. I think the uh, your proposed uh, custom questions are fine. And just to be clear, you've already voted to do it. We've already approved the contract. <laughs> <laughs> the, only, the only issue for debate tonight is what the questions are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right, right. right. I've been on the council. <laughs> Never know. <laughs> uh, Lauren, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think the the suggested questions look good. Um, maybe maybe on top issues. I mean, I think those all make sense, and I assume there's a limited number, but something on climate or I actually thought of that after it's putting the climate change in. um that might be one to add there if it looks like maybe you can do more than five yeah I mean those are I think you can do yeah I don't I don't think it's unlimited but you might be able to do as many as okay so and and then the I mean for the other possible questions I liked the um just we got a lot of feedback from the equity assessment about the um, opportunities to participate in community matters. Um, and we are redoing the community's website. So in terms of getting some baseline data that then in a comparable format for future years, those might be two good ones because you know we're doing efforts right now to try to improve those and let's see if we're actually making progress over time. Um, so I might Just recommend- that in as a baseline question. Yeah, th that was my thought. Um, Go ahead. I would just suggest re rephrasing D12 from American Indian. Please. So I just see if we can. Um, I'll ask them. I think, I'm not sure if this is their copyrighted, but we're buying this thing. The only, the only thing we really have is there's one space. This half page is where we get to print mm -hmm. ours. But I will ask if that can yeah, be done. Just Native American. Yep. No, I from India. Yes. Yeah. Just say it. Yeah. Fair no, enough. I, Thank I, you. I it all the way. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. There was another one I caught <clears throat> that I'd asked my thing to change. So, so, yes. it's so I, weird that they would not be able to. That because well, like they yeah. They I'll ask them. I, I I agree. I think that's a that's important. The one I actually asked them. There was one uh, number eleven. Where they ranked us and the federal government, I said, well, "Could you please put the state government too?" Because yeah. it would actually be more relevant to see how people rank the local government, state government. Mm -hmm. so, uh, we really can't. And so, well, then can we take the whole question? Out? Uh, yeah, because, you know, I, it's not really useful. You know, the state right. Board. I mean, do they? Are they trying to compare it across? Anyway, all right. I don't, I don't know. Um, one other thing, if so, I had the same thought about adding climate to top issues. Also, wondering about adding childcare um, or uh, also vibrancy of the downtown. What's that? You might be allowed to Okay. The other thing, and this is not for this, but again, just so that you are aware, I think I've told you this before. There's also going to be, and it is online only, so that's a restriction. But it's we're going to have a, a regular polling or surveying capacity for as much as we want and you can so you can do things where you you know rank these and rank order there's all kinds of different things so we, we will have the ability to send out other questions as we choose and you know obviously the Elks Club and other projects just as things come up you know people can once people sign up they'll get them in, in the email and they'll be able to respond so uh, 
you know, you'll have a lot of opportunity to sort of ask the public about things that are happening. Great. Uh, Donna. I would prefer all of these be rank order because I might do 25% with the bridge and 25 with this and, and likewise issue facing Montpelier, particularly if you're going to go to broad issues like climate change, I'd really like to see a, a, again, a, a numbered priority. If we can. Yeah, that's, that's a great thought. Otherwise, you, you got to pick one. And I'm not sure what that's going to tell us. Other than 10% of the people think this is the most important issue in the city. Okay, I'll check. Yeah. Okay. I uh, suppose we probably could use a motion about that. Sure. And what I wrote down was that you'd like to do the question about source of information and ideally in rank order. You'd like to add climate change, childcare, and downtown to the top issues also in rank order, and then have the rate, the opportunities to participate and rate the community's website. This was the notes I got. And ask them about the um, Native American. Oh, um, yes, but the, that was the questions to add. Oh, okay. Yes, okay. but I will write that. Yes, Jack. I'm, I'm happy to have Bill just, you know, Bill's doing the interaction, he's the point of contact with this company. Just take our feedback and go with it. Okay. We, no, oh, Don. No, no, I agree with that. Just that when, once you said vibrant downtown, then I easily went to parks. And they're not here. Yes. Again, I think yep. there are a lot of questions about the, you know, the parks and things. We get a chance to rank all of our services, including city parks and things. You know, excellent, good, fair, poor. Um, these are just the special questions you're asking, in addition to what's asked. Is your decision. Okay. Well, I, <laughs> that's fine. But I just want. Yep, no, you're right. Okay. When we get it all back and someone says, how come you didn't ask about X? <laughs> I mean, I read over the other ones, but it's so lengthy. I couldn't tell you all the questions right now. And obviously, you're much more familiar with the whole the whole. And, and so the way, just so people know, uh, and the schedule is in here. Once we finalize this, as you can see, um, they'll be going out to the community in um, June, early June. And there are, they do mailings. Uh, and But the... Unlike the last time, it was all mailing, and it's statistically significant. There will also be an online uh, accompaniment. It won't be, you know, necessarily statistically significant because people self-select, but we'll at least be able to compare those responses to the the mail-in responses and see, you know. And they said, quite frankly, they're usually pretty close. That you know, even the self-selections match, but they, they can't validate them like you can on an official survey. So you just get more more responses. So. Um, so, yeah, should be good, good information okay. for people who like data. Yay. <laughs> I, I okay. love data. Um, so do we don't need a, a motion then? Is that kind of what we're feeling, team? Okay, great. Well, let's move on then. Yes, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, appointment to the Montpelier Live Board. This is something that we had put off previously. So I did talk with Montpelier Live about this. And they, um, there is nothing in their uh, bylaws that requires a city council member. They said they like having one, um, that it's been nice for continuity, you know, connection. On the other hand, you know, they are right in our building and we have a lot of communication. So I think their feedback was, unless there's somebody who really wants to do it, Jay really wanted to do it, and then we've had people, it's just someone saying, I'll do it because no one else will then, you know, they're fine, um, but they obviously appreciate it when there's someone who's really interested. So, I mean, I think it was still welcome to group that was there for a Donna, go ahead. Did you happen to talk about in the past, it was just being a, a eyes and ears, you weren't allowed to vote when I, I was the I think that's right. Yeah, I think and, the attendance. And yet, right. in the notes, it said they wanted this person to be able to serve on one of their subcommittees, several subcommittees, and I thought, wow. Well, That's a think, big obligation when you can't vote. Yeah, I think, you know, I think Jay was really active. And I think, in fact, I think he's going on their board um, as a resident. So, well, I was active too, but again, you couldn't vote. Yeah. Mm, so, yeah, well, they were fine either way. So, does anyone want to uh, join the board? Okay. I'm not seeing. 
Anybody jumping up right now? Um, you can always do it later. You can always do it later. Connor, yeah. <laughs> Connor, we nominated you. That's where the meeting comes yeah. <laughs> Okay, I think we're moving on then. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the last thing is the summer schedule, and we've got some proposed dates here. Yes. A couple of dates with no meetings. Yeah. Yeah. Ahead. So, um, you know, typically we try to eliminate at least one summer meeting and give some space between meetings for people to take summer breaks. When we, when I put out my first schedule, there were at least two people that already knew they had a, a conflict um, for July 13th. So we're already starting with a five person board. And then um, Donna had said she didn't have a specific conflict, but prefer to have the time off later in August. So uh, taking a look at that, I said, my thought was, we will need something around July 13 to set the tax rate, but we've done that by call in or Zoom. It takes two minutes. It's a math calculation. So we'd have to have some sort of special thing to do that, and you know, who knows, maybe a consent agenda or something, get some contracts approved. Um, but then have our regular meeting, push it in between the normal July dates. Have one July meeting on the 20th, and then basically not have another one for another month till the end of August, August 24. So we have kind of that whole from July 20 to August 24, summer break off. And if we needed a special meeting, obviously there's time in there to do it. And there's also, um, the way the calendar falls, there's three weeks but between the 24 and the 14th. So there's an August 31st and a September 7. If we needed, if we really felt we were back up, so we have some fallback. Um, so that was my thought based on the feedback. And also, given how loaded our meetings have been, we have, I think, unless more comes up, we've, I think, now spread the load out so that it's pretty manageable between now and then. Thoughts? Okay. Oh, okay. Donna, what do you think? Yeah, it's okay. Carrie, what do you think? Looks okay. Good to me. All right. All the thumbs are up. That's great. So. Uh, so we should have a motion. We should have a motion. Setting meeting yeah. dates. So so Lauren. Oh, so moved. And is there a second? Second. Okay. Further discussion. Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 No, and I, up, oh, uh, opposed. I really, I really don't like to go too long between meetings. Just keep them up, but I'll suck it up. <laughs> <laughs> Did you vote no? No, he did not vote no. He did not vote no. He did not vote no. Uh, okay. Thank you. And so to council reports, Donna, are you ready to go? Uh, certainly. I will be quick. Uh, the Stormwater Committee sent out its RFQ for um, quotes on doing the developing its policy. It's been meeting uh, with Zoom, and Zach has been very challenged with the technical stuff, but really pushing through. The Justice Restorative Committee is studying the little book of race and restorative justice. It's a short book, but I highly recommend it. I'll actually bring it to the next meeting and show it to you. It's very dense, but very good. And the park has put out a survey that I would hope the council as well as the public will go. And it's a flyer talking about all these walks in Hubbard Park. So we've had all this wonderful expansion and there's just several days in May and several days in June where you can go in a group and see various sections of the park. So I encourage people to go online and get this schedule. And also just a heads up that Bill and I attended a Zoom meeting with the pilot shelters uh, staff and we shared that information with the homelessness task force this morning. And so you'll see that coming up in the future. And that the Complete Streets and Mont Montpelier Transportation Infrastructure Committee is moving ahead with the bike path uh, lane, the bike lane on Barry Street. So you'll see that going up in June. Thank you. Thanks. Do, you, do you know that it would be really great if we could make sure we're providing lots of advance notice to the folks on Barry Street before that goes in? Yes, it and is so definitely have dates, on. May have, yes. Make sure that Corey's touching base with our. Yes, yes, I'll remind Corey, but it has come up every time we've talked about it. Great. Uh, I'm going to go to Carrie next. Uh, Thank you. Um, I just have a, an announcement for um, 
District 3 residents or anyone else is interested, there's a proposed development that's being worked on off Isabel Circle, and some of the neighbors have called, um, are getting together to talk about it. And uh, the developers of that proposed development are um, hosting a meeting, an informational meeting tomorrow at four o'clock at the end of Isabel Circle. And so um, if folks are you know, from that neighborhood or interested in learning more about it, they can attend that meeting. If, you, if anyone wants any more detailed information about it, they can contact me and I'm happy to put them in touch with the appropriate people. That's it. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer. Um, I don't have any committee um, things to touch on, but it is warming up and people are getting outside. And I just wanted to remind everybody to please try to walk gently on, on the earth right now. She's very fragile. So um, when you're going out and picnicking or camping or just getting away, please remember to clean up after yourselves, pack out. And if you see any extra stuff on the ground, please pick that up as well and um, be safe out there. That's all. Yeah. Thank you. Jack. I uh, <clears throat> wanted to mention John Snell posted this on Facebook and people may or may not know about it, but uh, the Vermont Urban and Community Forest Program is celebrating Arbor Day this month and issuing awards, uh, uh, Vermont Tree Steward Awards, including one, the Unsung Hero Award to Montpelier's own John Akilajic from the uh, Montpelier Tree Board. Um, and the citation goes on to talk about how John started uh, studying and preparing for addressing the emerald ash, ash borer infestation back in 2012 and he's mm -hmm. been taking the lead on Montpelier, preparing Montpelier to uh, to respond to that uh, for 10 years now and uh, it's a well-deserved recognition. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Lauren. Thanks. Um, the only thing on my mind that hasn't already been brought up. Um, so we heard from Linda Berger earlier about the water resource recovery facility. It was just reminding me, and I've had a couple conversations with constituents wondering what's going on with the leachate issue. And I was expecting a re the, the permit was supposed to be out in January or so, and we still haven't seen it. And so mm -hmm. I'm really curious what's happening. And I think there um, have been some delays, which could impact you know what's going on in the timeline that we thought was going to happen for getting the um, pilot project for filtration in place. So either inviting a and R in for an update yeah, as part of that, together. just do it together can, as a, do a work next update if there's space on the agenda yep. or get them in soon. Um, that would be great. Thanks. Uh, I just have a couple of things. Uh, today I got to go to the uh, Vermont Municipal Equipment Show and Field Day. Uh, and Barry, that was very cool, actually. It was it was uh, really fun to see all the equipment and there were um, like snowplow driving competitions and they had to try to not knock over cones as they went through this course. Uh, it, was, it was fascinating. It was great. And I am just very, um, I just want to recognize that we had some of our staff there who were actually helping to, to run some of the, the programming there. So just um, want to shout out to them and, and thank them for doing that. And some of our former staff. And former staff, yes. Um, so that was uh, one thing. The other thing is um, that this last Friday, I announced that I am running for uh, Senate to represent the Washington County Senate District and um, planning on remaining here as mayor um, until I get or if I get uh, elected. And um, so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see how it goes, um, but I'm grateful to, to, to be here. So that's it for me. Um, John Odom, are you here? You are, go ahead. Taxes are due Monday. Taxes, taxes, taxes. One of two things in life that are certain. Don't forget it. Great, thank you. And hey, John. Oh, yes, go ahead. John, while you're there, since you weren't here physically, do we have uh, warrants to sign at uh, the police department? There are very few, and I haven't confirmed this with finance, but there shouldn't be any reason why they can't wait till next time. Thanks. I couldn't hear what he said. He said a yes, we need to go somewhere. No, he said they could wait. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. 
And Bill. Um, so we're continuing to work on the Elks Club. We hope to have for the next meeting, at the very least, um, at least a recommendation for some funding to start the project management. You may have a draft RFP. We're working on that. Um, so that's that's happening. Um, we are I'm, I'm getting some feedback now from MIAC about the energy position. I, Ding the two council member, or the council member and the mayor who had been involved in MEAC to get their feedback, and I appreciated that. And now uh, MEAC has it, so uh, we'll look for that and get that thing moving. Um, legislature hasn't uh, completed yet, but we, I think, uh, it looks as though there's uh, funding for dispatch, regional dispatch. So hopefully, uh, some part, or some or all of the equipment, the Televate study will be funded. Um, so that was good, uh, the way that came out. Um, you know, it ain't over till it's over, but that the, the conference committee has agreed on that part. So that looks good. Can yeah. I just add, Maggie, the lobbyist, was very helpful, very helpful. Yeah. And uh, yes, and also we, it looks like we're going to successfully get some special language in about TIF, which will take a lot of pressure off of us um, without getting into too much inside baseball. Uh, I've been really concerned that we have a reappraisal coming and that, you know, you set your base TIF district, when you set it, we create a tax increment finance district, you create the district and then you say, okay, here's the tax the values that are in that district, and then a new increment is what pays for improvements. Well, if you have a reappraisal, everything increases in value. And so my concern was that was all going to go into a TIF district and not help the general taxpayers. And there's nothing really in statute or in the rules that address that. So they're going to basically, they've drafted and we worked with the auditor's office and it looks, well, I'm pretty sure it's going to pass. There's a little exemption for us to allow us to reset our, it's called OTV, original taxable value, after we complete the reappraisal um, so that we would start, you know, and because we haven't issued any debt, we haven't done any projects, so it's not like we're already paying using that increment. So we're kind of in a unique spot. So that, uh, I've been really concerned that we might have to actually scrap our TIF district because of this and start all over again, but it looks like we're going to get a one-time fix, so. Great, great, okay. All right, well, I think that is it. So without objection, we will consider the meeting adjourned, 8.53. Whoa, all right. <laughs>